<clears throat> the scripture passage this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses, verse 26 through chapter 12, verse, the first half of verse 13. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager, meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did, not, uh, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David said, or Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord, to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the, this very son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the scriptures. <clears throat> well, this text narrates a disturbing story of one of the most pivotal and beloved characters in the Bible, King David. Even the Holy One describes him as someone after God's own heart. He was overlooked by his father when the prophet Samuel sought someone to replace uh, uh, the wayward King Saul. He slayed the giant Goliath with modest weapons and bold faith. He led the army in battle and the people in praise as he was an accomplished musician. 
There seemed to be nothing that David could not do well. He served as a model leader, and the whole messianic prophecy revolved around him and his descendants. Then there's this shocking story of David and Bathsheba that tarnishes David's image. That's one thing I love about the Bible. The authors told the good and the bad. They didn't try to put a positive spin on everything and ignore the bad things like our politicians do now. No, they told it like it is, the good and the bad. Because it's not about human beings, it's about God. Yes, human beings are important to our story, but the whole Bible is meant to reveal something about God. Last week, I talked about the story of David and Bathsheba. David was not where he was supposed to be. It was the time of year that kings go out to war, but David sent his troops out to war and stayed in Jerusalem. Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, he saw from the rooftop the beautiful Bathsheba bathing, and David wanted her for himself. David gave in to his own selfish desires. David was no longer serving God. David was serving David. He gave in to his own desires. Well, of course, he could do that. He was the king. He could have anything he wanted and he wanted Bathsheba. <clears throat> but he got Bathsheba pregnant. So David schemed to cover up his indiscretion that would soon become an embarrassment. He brought Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, home from the war so that he would go to his house and make love to his wife, and then he would think that the baby was his own. <clears throat> but Uriah, had more integrity and self-discipline than David did. He refused to satisfy his own personal desires while all his compatriots were sacrificing, sleeping in tents, and enduring the hardships of war, a war which David should have been involved in right along there with Uriah and those compatriots. So David's plan failed. So now David had to develop a calculating, manipulative scheme to get what he wants. He eliminates Uriah so that he can marry Bathsheba and legitimize what he has done. He sent word to his general jo Joab to put Uriah in the front lines where the fighting was the heaviest, then pull back so that Uriah would be killed in battle. What a scoundrel David has become. It's the old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. David had all the power in the relationship and he exerts that power. Before facing the consequences of his action, his sole concern is his own desires, his wants, his security, his reputation, his loss. David's thoughts and actions are sinful. They are so contrary to the image and character of David that we see in the rest of the Bible. It only goes to show how the best can stray from God's will and God's way. We all have moments of weakness. None of us are perfect. And we all need to rely on God's help. All this serves as background. What I really wanted to focus on today is Nathan and how he confronts King David. It's a masterful job. He doesn't march right up to the king and accuse him of adultery and murder. That would surely have resulted in his execution. The king doesn't have to take that 
And to do such a thing would be an affront to the king for which he would have to respond in order to save his face. So Nathan comes up with a parable that will evoke anger from the king at the injustice that's being carried out. Essentially, he gets the king to sentence himself. It reminds me of what we did in the JCs years ago. The JCs have an award that's very prestigious. It's called a senatorship. Chapters honor members who have been really involved in the leadership of the organization for years by awarding them a senatorship. These senatorships were usually presented at a state convention and they were supposed to be a big secret until the award was presented. When someone was being given a senatorship, there would be three speeches. The first was pretty generic so that no one probably could guess who was receiving the senatorship, trying to build the suspense, but making people aware that there would be a senatorship. The second gave a little more detail about the person, so the people who knew the person may figure it out at that point. And then the third actually calls the person forward to receive the award. Well, our club was going to award a senatorship to Pat Felder, who has since passed away, so I feel comfortable using his real name in my sermon. Pat was asked to make the first speech for this award. I don't know if they told him that someone else was being awarded this senatorship and just keep it generic, or if they told him that someone from the Houston JCs was being awarded a senatorship, but, uh, and they wanted him to make the first uh, speech, but they refused to give him the name. Either way, Pat got up and made a generic speech that someone special from the Houston JCs was about to be awarded a senatorship. It was all done in fun, and it may have kept Pat from guessing that he was the one being awarded the senatorship, but I think it's kind of like Nathan getting King David to pronounce sentence on himself. Pat was awarding himself the senatorship. <laughs> I'm so impressed with how Nathan handled confronting the king about the injustice of what the king did. It is hard to, uh, to confront people. You can't get in their face or they will become defensive and dig in ever, even more. You have to find a way to help them recognize the injustice of the situation. I think the only way we can do that is to talk to them in love and humility. I know some people have posted their anger over the opening ceremony of the Olympics. One Facebook friend shared some very acerbic words. I cautioned her to forgive and meekly accept that that is how the world treats Christians. But her response was that Christians have been trampled on too long and that has led to this opening ceremony desecrating Christ in the Christian faith. So then I cautioned her to confront in love. She thought she was, but I thought her words sounded rather hostile. Many have lost their life over confronting injustice. Martin Luther King comes to mind and I think he did a pretty respectable job of pointing out the injustice of discrimination. But those who were in power and liked the power that they had were offended and it cost him his life. There were many who thought the Vietnam War was unjust and many students at Kent University lost their lives while they were attempting to confront the injustice. But I will say that no matter whether the war was just or not, we need to value those that have served in the military during that time for doing the job that their country called them to do, whether the country was right or wrong. As 2 Timothy 2.4 says, 
No one serving in the army gets entangled in everyday affairs. The soldier's aim is to please the enlisting officer. Jesus himself lost his life because he confronted the religious leaders of his day about the rules with which they burdened the people. Now, I'm not good at confronting people. I don't like conflict. So I, I asked ChatGPT, which is an artificial intelligence product, how to confront injustice diplomatically. And here's what it said. Number one, understand the issue thoroughly. Research it. Gather all the relevant information and understand the nuances of the issue. Identify stakeholders. Recognize who is affected by the injustice and who holds power to make changes. Number two, communicate clearly and calmly. Express concerns. Clearly articulate the problem and how it affects individuals or groups. Stay calm. Maintain a composed demeanor to avoid escalating tensions. Number three, build alliances. Seek support. Find allies who share your concerns and can help amplify your message. Network, engage in, with organizations, community groups, and influencers who can provide support and resources. Number four, use facts and evidence. Present data. Use factual information and evidence to support your case. And be specific. Provide clear examples and case studies to illustrate the injustice. Number five, engage in dialogue. Listen actively. Show willingness, willingness to learn to differ, to, to show willingness to listen to different perspectives and understand opposing views. And then find common ground. Identify shared values or goals that can help bridge the gaps. Number six, propose solutions. Offer alternatives. Suggest practical and fair solutions to the problem. Be constructive. Focus on positive change rather than merely criticizing the status quo. Number seven, utilize diplomatic channels. Use, uh, use established channels like petitions, formal complaints, or legal avenues if applicable. Engage in public discussions, town hall meetings, or media to raise awareness. Number eight, be patient and persistent. Stay committed. Change often takes time, so remain patient and persistent in your efforts. Adapt tactics. Be flexible and willing to adjust your approach based on feedback and developments. Number nine, maintain integrity and respect. Respect your opponents and treat those who oppose you with respect and dignity. And conduct yourself ethically. Ensure your actions are ethical and maintain a high moral standard. Number 10, educate and raise awareness. Inform others. Use various platforms to educate the public about the injustice and its impacts. Engage creatively. Use art, storytelling, social media, and other creative methods to engage and inspire others. David's actions did not violate the law because David was the king. Whatever he said was the law. But his actions were contrary to God's will for his life. And he didn't seek God first before he acted. 
When confronted by Nathan, David repented and God forgave David, but there were still consequences as a result of David's actions. I love the way Nathan confronted David, finding a parallel situation and applying it to the problem at hand can be very helpful. 